uh, Matthew 6. Technically, we're going to be in Luke 12. It's the same passage, same Sermon on the Mount verses. <clears throat> Luke 12, 22 through 34. I'm also going to say, I'm going to be really honest tonight. I know that that's never an issue for me, is being honest. But I'm going to ask you to be honest. Some of you guys have already heard this sermon before. I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself. Um, I always, all good preaching of the Word of God exalts Christ, points people towards Him, instructs from the Word of God, and, and then lastly, at least lastly, what it does is it makes you come to grips with who and what you are in the context. And in this case, th this is deadly serious. Okay? That's why I'm asking that you get in the mood for what we're talking about. I know some of you have heard this, but I preached this sermon on March 1st, 2023. So if you were not here in this youth ministry at that point, uh, 11 months ago, you didn't hear this. Okay, And that's actually quite a bit of you, and there's also quite a bit of you who have been here way longer than I have. So um, I'm going to start out by being honest and open, and I hope you hear me say this. I have been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Um, when my son was younger, I was diagnosed with that clinically. Uh, they gave me medicine. And I couldn't handle the medicine. It made me want to kill myself. Um, I couldn't stick it out until the meds lowered. And um, it altered my mind to such a degree I just couldn't handle it. And um, I'm not saying meds are bad. Please hear me say that. I'm not saying meds are bad. I'm saying for whatever reason, whatever they gave me. And I know oftentimes you got to try different medications. And I just didn't want to do that. And I stopped taking them the day that I decided... Um, that I had to force myself not to drive my car off a bridge on the way to work um, with my wife and my son in the back of the car. So I say that to be very crisply candid clear. If you've ever battled anxiety or you've battled any mental illness or disorder or soulish malady, you know it's not a joke. There's nothing joking about this. Okay? So I want, if you have been diagnosed with something in here, you are not alone. First of all, there's tons of us that either got something going on with us and we don't know it yet, or got something going on with us and we do know it and we got a diagnosis. But let me also say this. There is also the true sort of reality that I am in the same boat as you are. Now, I have not taken medication in, I guess it's four years. I took it for like five days and I haven't taken any since. Okay? I'm not saying that's the right way to go about it. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is it worked for me and I've tried to manage, maybe not well. If Keaton was here, she'd be shaking her head. Manage my anxiety not well. I realized that the big trigger for me was my son. Okay, But anxiety is defined as a constant worry that makes it hard for someone to do everyday tasks. Anxiety disorders are the most common form of mental illness in the United States. Most common form of mental illness. I don't think I need to convince you of that. I think we all see that, right? 25% of people between the ages of 13 and 19 years old are affected by anxiety. 25%, at least. 80% of kids with anxiety disorders are not getting treatment at all. 80%, and I, when I say treatment, I mean clinical treatment. I mean that if you have anxiety disorders and you are not getting medication or you are not getting counseling, therapy, and various other forms, but those are the most common, you would fall in this category. You are not receiving treatment. And the, the, the scary part is it's not the most of kids have clinical anxiety disorder, but 80% of the ones who do are totally unregulated and oftentimes dysregulated. Anxiety is, has been proven to be the cause of so many failed and destructive relationships within society Especially at the, the world that we live in with social media. I could, I could go on and on. I could do a sermon series on how social media has absolutely wrecked our confidence. How it's wrecked the way we see the world. How it's destroyed our dopamine receptors in our brain. How it has absolutely warped our sense of human relationships as well as worry. So, I would be remiss, this would not be H2O Bible study, if I didn't actually read the text before we go any further. So Luke 22 through 34. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. 
Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouses nor barns, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, and a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, talked about this last week, and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's roughly where we left off last week. Let me also say this. You don't get an excuse. Hear me. You don't get an excuse when it comes to anxiety based upon your circumstances. Anxiety is a sin. Worry is sin. Saturday morning at about 9.30 I get a text saying my grandfather had passed away overnight. Anxiety, fear, an encroaching sense of darkness crept over me and my whole family. We'll have the visitation tomorrow night and at Friday at 2 o'clock we're going to bury my grandfather. I will never see him again until I meet him in glory one day when I join him. If you don't think that anxiety has been a battle in my life since Saturday morning, you got another thing coming. This is real to me this week more than it has been at any point in quite a little bit of time. Yes, sir. Isn't it a sin because you don't have full faith that God will... Right, and, and yes, and I'll get to that. So a couple of things. You don't have to write this. It's, it, the good thing is this is on recording. It's on Facebook. It'll be on YouTube. Generalized anxiety disorder affects 6.8 million adults, or 3.1% of the U.S. population, yet it only affects 43.2% of people that are receiving treatment. Panic disorder. Panic disorder affects 6 million adults at the time of writing this, or 2.7% of the U.S. population. Social anxiety disorder. Anybody have this one? Social anxiety. Quite a lot of these, most likely. Um, when you walk into this room and you see everybody look at you, your response for the first couple of milliseconds probably tells you whether you would fall into this category or not. Or if you like public speaking, right? That, that's such a dreaded class in you know freshman level, you know, <laughs> entrance in public, you know, uh, college education, uh, or maybe you take it in high school. I mean, didn't we talk about this? Let's talk about you taking that class, right? Yeah. Yeah. So look at me. Look at me being a good youth pastor and remember. So, social anxiety disorder affects 15 million adults. Think about that. Or 7.1% of the U.S. population. We have specific phobias. Anybody know what a phobia is? All right. Define it, AJ. Uh, okay, yeah, right? It's a chronic and persisting fear of something, right? So, focus, focus. we got way, way, way more to go. Specific phobias affect 19.3 million adults in the U.S. or 9.1% of the U.S. population. Obsessive compulsive disorder affects 2.5 million adults or only 1.2% of the U.S. population. I don't care. 2.5 million adults is still a lot of adults. right? Post-traumatic stress or shock disorder. PTSD, as you know it, affects 7.7 .7 million adults or 3.6% of the U.S. population. Here are some biblical causes, and I wrote this down, causes for anxiety, not excuses. Causes, not excuses. We are separated from God both physically and spiritually by sin. Reminder, Genesis 3, verse 6. The woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. 
And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Number two, we are separated from each other by sin and selfishness. This causes anxiety. How many, how many of you guys had a, a bump in today in some relational aspect with someone and you had conflict and then immediately what followed is, oh my gosh, how do I relate to them now? What, how, do I, how do I feel? Are we still cool? Should I talk to them? Or will they let me talk to them? Or should I be mean to them? Or how am I supposed to defend myself? How am I supposed to relate to that person myself? Right? Anybody in this room know what I'm talking about? Where, where you have conflict in a relationship that previously was fine, and then you go, well, the next time I see them, I don't know how I'm going to react. Right? Hey, it could be, it, some, of y'all, y'all, some of y'all do this to me all the time, but I love you anyway. It doesn't affect my relationship with you. But send you a text message, you don't respond, or you leave me on read or delivered. And you might go, now you don't do this. I, I think most of y'all don't do this because you know I don't. That does. I love you regardless. That doesn't That's change that. Answer. And I'm just going to bully right past the fact that you ignore me anyway. So, uh, but most people don't do that. Most people, they go, oh my gosh, they left me on delivered and read. I, I don't, I don't, they must have some wrong with me. And against me, they must be mad at me, right? And, then, and yes, a lot of y'all looking guilty because a lot of y'all didn't text me back today. And that's okay. You know what? I love you and I forgive you. Anyway. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse. Here we go. Excuse. Right? Now, let, let me also say this though. Thank you, man. A lot of y'all did. Thank you to you guys who are actually going to heaven and you responded to me today. And you demonstrated your faith by doing this. So. Um, all right, you ready? Let's keep going. We got a lot to do. So, Genesis six four through eight. I'm going to skip some of these verses because I don't want to read all of this. I have, I think it literally is like twenty five pages. It, it's unbelievable. So, but we're probably going to have to break it up in this week and next week potentially. So, um, Genesis four six through eight. <laughs> they like hear you over there. Uh, number three, we are not in control of what happens to us, and so it makes us anxious. Can anybody be honest in here and testify to the fact that when we feel like life is out of control, we also feel like we are out of control. And we feel like we can't regulate because we, let's be honest, even though we don't want to admit it, most of us are control freaks. I would argue that sin makes us control freaks. I would argue that being a control freak is just another way of controlling your anxiety. In other words... I heard somebody say this the other day. God is not a perfectionist. Because a perfectionist is someone who knows they're not perfect, but they hold themselves and everyone else to that standard. God is not a perfectionist because God is perfect. God's not anxious because everything is in control. And everything... I don't know how many times I've had to tell myself that this week. Everything is going according to plan. Not my plan, but it's going according to his plan. He is just as much in charge today as he was Friday night. He has not lost one wink of sleep. He doesn't need to sleep. He is always on the throne. Why would I be worried when he is arraying the flowers of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow? The lilies were used as a, for a reason. And that reason is that they oftentimes bloom overnight. These, these, these wildflowers bloom overnight and they're gone. Sometimes the next day in the heat. But God makes them beautiful for a few hours. If he takes care of those dang flowers, he's going to take care of me. And he has taken care of my grandfather. And he's done nothing wrong to me and my family. He is just every bit as good as he was before that happened. Amen? I hope you believe that. Number three, you've already written this. We are not in control of what happens to us. And because we're not in control, we constantly want to fight and scrounge for control. 
Scrounging for control is not a, it's not a quality of leadership. I know some of you tell yourself that. You fighting for control in your life is not you being a good leader because we don't have enough captains on the ship. We've got too many monkeys. We don't have enough captains. So please understand, I've got to take charge because who's going to if I don't? How many of you guys are like that? You're like, man, you know what? If, if it feels like chaos, I'm just going to, like, I'm just going to do something about it. Like, I, I have to, like, soothe myself with the illusion of control. AJ, you like that? You, or are you just pretty go with the flow? So Leah, so Leah, some, you kind of strike me like you're you're more like I'm gonna take charge if I get a chance. I'm gonna take charge, right? right? And that, that's okay. That's okay. My point is this though. Please hear me. There's a fine line between using the gifts God gave you and trying to be God. And we struggle with that more more than we would ever care to admit. James 4, 13 through 15. Is that verse? James 4, 13 through 15. I'm not going to read it because we don't have time. Number four, we're worried about death. This one hits home. We're worried about death. I wrote this 11 months ago. But we're worried about death. Death indicates to us that life is not in our control ultimately. And no matter what we do until that moment. I can't avoid it. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. Most of the things that we do in our society now that you see on advertising on TV is an attempt to try to avoid death, to try to escape it. Whether it be Olay and the cosmetic commercials, whether it be all the vitamins and all the medicines they're telling you to take. Every time you go to the pharmacy, it's an attempt to try to lengthen your lifespan because you need medicine of some sort. Every time I walk in the bathroom, the first thing I do in the morning is I walk into the bathroom I open up a couple of pill bottles, I drop a couple of pills in my hand, and I throw them in my mouth. One's a vitamin, and one's my blood pressure medicine. Why? Because I'm trying to prolong my life. And although I don't say, taking these pills so I don't die this afternoon, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. I am constantly trying to get the upper hand on death and keep it at arm's distance. In fact, most of us don't want to keep death at an arm's distance. We want to keep it so far away we never see it. One thing to kill somebody or have your avatar die on PUBG, and it's quite another thing to experience it up close and personal. I don't know if you've ever seen a dead person. I don't know if you've ever touched a dead person. I don't know if you've ever watched someone die but I've done all of the above. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. And Friday I'm going to have to look at my grandfather in a box for the last time. And then I'm going to have to grab the front of the coffin and I'm going to have to drag him to the place in the ground where they put him in there forever. Never to return until Christ cracks the sky open and comes back and raises the dead. But that's going to happen. We try to avoid death at every turn. And when we feel like we're sick enough that things might get really serious, then we start to panic. I know people that stub their toe and they act like they're going to die. I know people that catch a very small common cold, get a few sniffles, and they're like, hmm. Must have HIV. It's over. Had a good run. Right? And then there's people, and then there's people, and, and I, I, I say this with respect, then there's people like my grandfather. It's like, if I ain't on the ground unconscious, I'm fine. Yeah. And he wasn't fine. But he let it go for too long. Diabetes, heart stuff, all of the above, right? So so a lot of a lot of Gen Z and Gen Alpha people, we, we love I'm not I'm not you. I'm not you. But, and I'm not proud of that, by the way. I'm not proud of that. But, I'm not proud of any of it, to be honest with you. I made a YouTube video. Go watch it. So, here's my point. I, I say that to say this. What I've noticed is boomers love, love to just say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Homie, you're broke. You're broke in all kind of ways. 
You know, you can't sleep a full night without shouting, I didn't do it. Take me back to Nam. You know, like there's, we, we need to understand that like they have this extreme coping mechanism where they're like, ah, I, the greatest generation raised me. I'm fine. You ain't been to Okinawa, have you? You know, it's, and then there's, and then there's us, then there's you guys that are like, oh my gosh, I've got a hangnail. I'm going to pass out. I'm going to die. Right. And there's, and I, I say that with disrespect on both ends. Okay. Right. Like I, I don't mean anything but harm by saying that. So please hear me. Like, and then there's us that. Responsible for a lot of other things. So, number five. Shh. Hear you, sinners. Number five. We are never satisfied with what we have because sin is a merciless taskmaster. We are anxious because we're never satisfied with what we have. I think this is a fire sign. But, we're not ever satisfied with what we have because we could always have more, right? We want. Because we take shelter and confidence. I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to just go on a limb and say, psychologically, I think there's a better than likely chance that people who hoard, and we talked about that the week before, people who hoard are very likely people who are trying to control their life and control their sense of self and death ultimately because if they think they have enough of something, then they can take confidence in the amount of something that they have. The trouble is, never enough. Right? No amount of Neutrogena is ever going to be enough. No amount of cats that your old single aunt collects. Never going to be enough. No amount of money that your businessman father puts in his bank account. Never going to be enough. No amount of essential oils and diffusers you have all over your house. Because you have a hippie mother. Never going to be enough. No matter how many vitamins you take every day. Never going to be enough. Right? Because all ultimately it's going to take is one piece of candy. Or one substance that you unknowingly take. That's laced with fentanyl and it's over. It's happening all the time all over this country. Hashtag Texas High. So, let me also say this, right? Now, I'm just, we're just being honest, okay? See, what I've done is to control my life, I've fled to red water, right? And, and, yeah, you're right, bro. We, we switch places. We switch places, right? Um, number six, we are anxious because we're busy building kingdoms. That are coming to nothing. We're anxious because we're building kingdoms that are coming to nothing. We spin our wheels. We pour water that we just scooped out of the ocean back into the ocean. Like we really did something. We did nothing. They're passing away. And we know it and you know it. And no amount of lies will ever change the fact that you know it. You're just building castles in the sand. No matter how great it is, the wave is going to come in eventually and it's going to level it all back to the way it was before. The sooner, young people, that you learn that, I promise the better your life will be. Now here's a few ways that anxiety tells us about our faith. A few ways that anxiety tells us about our faith. Anxiety reveals why it is we stop walking by faith and walk by what we see and understand. Anxiety reveals why it is we stop walking by faith. Remember, you all know this verse. You probably got it plastered in some prayer wall or cross wall at your house. Hebrews 11.1 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can't have, some, I can't have faith in something that I can see. Right? I don't. I wouldn't call it faith that I believe Ryan is about 20, 25 feet away from me. It's not really faith. She's there. I can see her. She can see me. I can see her. I don't think that's faith. Now, I, you could argue, because I can hear some people that are not here tonight saying, well, simulation theory, Taylor, we don't know, right? I mean, 
We don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe they're there, maybe they're not there, right? Who knows? But I don't actually have faith to believe that. We need to have faith because faith is the opposite of anxiety. Number two, anxiety reveals what we fear most and trust least. Anxiety reveals what we fear most and trust least. Luke 12, 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Number three, anxiety reveals that we trust in something for joy and comfort other than Christ. Anxiety reveals that we trust in something for joy and comfort other than Christ. And by the way, Romans 8, 31 through 33 is a good remedy for this. Listen, I had a conversation with somebody, because this is on camera, I'm not going to say the whole story. I had a conversation with somebody the other day that didn't necessarily know they were being, somebody dear to me, by the way, didn't know that they were being spiritually attacked. And then when we talked about it, it was very obvious to me that that's what was going on. And my point is, you can't fight with weapons that you don't know where they are. In the middle of the night, when something wakes you up, and I'm not going to get all spooky and weird, but something wakes you up and you feel like you're being crushed in some way, shape, or form by impending evil or voices or whispers or whatever it may be. Now, that's not the time to go, you know what? There's a Bible on the nightstand. Let me try to rifle through here and go on over to the Sermon on the Mount because that's what we've been learning in youth group. No, you got to hide that in your heart and your mind before that. Because what if it's sleep paralysis, ladies and gentlemen? And what if you can't move a muscle? But if you've got the word hidden in your heart, you can still fight. I'm being dead real with you, dead honest. Don't prepare in the dark, you prepare in the light. We train in the day so that if we have to fight at night, we're ready because it's muscle memory. Right? You are in a war. You are in a war. Some of you, I'm afraid, you're very close to being casualties because you don't have your dukes up at all. You're just... Walking through light, you know, getting sucker punched left and right. And you're like, where'd that come from? Why is my nose bleeding? Where are my teeth? It's because you don't have your dukes up. You're not protecting yourself. Anxiety reveals our desire to be God and be in control. Number five. Anxiety reveals we have a tendency to serve a God of outcomes, not the one over outcomes. Anxiety reveals that we have the tendency to serve a God of outcomes, not the God over outcomes. Jeremiah 2.13 My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters. And they have hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Number two, I'm sorry, number six. Anxiety reveals why many people lose faith in God. I like last night. Faith in God because of bad things that happen to them. Dale and I wrote that 11 months ago. Talk about that over and over. Anxiety reveals many people lose faith in God because bad things happen to them. And then the verse that I have tattooed on my forearm, on my arm, Jeremiah, I mean, sorry, John 9, 1 through 3. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, I remember preaching this sermon in here. You guys who were here, I cried through the whole thing, basically. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in his life. Number seven, anxiety reveals that we view some things as more important than God. More important.
more essential to us than God. You know how you got an idol, and I know I talk about idolatry a lot in here, but we need it. You know how you have an idol in your life? Remove it. See what happens. If it's if it's a small response, maybe it's just a normal way of coping with losing something. But if it's a giant response, if it's a response that you come to pieces over, you got yourself an idol. And that idol is core to who you think you are and core to what you want to be. Anxiety reveals all those things. So let me just say this. There, you have anxiety, but let's, let's not act like you don't. We all have anxiety. Some of us are ruled and governed by it, and some of us have small amounts that we sort of think we control. But you don't actually control anxiety. It's all bad. It's all sin. But please hear me. Your anxiety is useful in telling you, pointing to you, how things are out of order in your soul. Let that be an indicator to you to go, Lord, cleanse me of that. Wash that away. Reroute that. Give me wisdom. Give me, give me those fruits of the Spirit that you have promised to me to, to, to destroy this idol, so to say. Number eight. Anxiety reveals that at least momentarily we feel that we're owed certain results from God. I could go on and on about this. Go on. Anxiety reveals that at least momentarily we feel that we're owed certain results from God. What are you owed from God? No. You're owed something. That's a good place to start. Death. Suffering. Keep going. Get warmer. Hell. When people say this, I know you thought it was opposite day. So, when... Now listen to me. I, I sat in a youth group for all the years that I didn't want to. I sat in a youth group and my youth pastor, who is actually better than the average bear, which ain't saying much, but his name was Bobby. Bobby, if you're watching this, thank you for saying this. I remember being a kid about y'all's age, you know, 7th, 8th, ninth grade. I remember Bobby saying out loud, and of course we had a mega youth group. I'm sitting there with 120 other kids. And lights are off, and we got all the cool stuff in there, and we're just worried about the games we played before and the games we're going to play after. And we're sitting there acting like we listened to him, and we're we not, and he knows it, and that he's you know doing his thing. So he says, he asked us that question. He said, "What are you owed? What does God owe you?" And we started giving all these answers, you know, as if we were. Owed something wonderful from God. But he said, you're owed hell. And he screamed it. I'm not going to scream it. He screamed it. He was an angry redhead person. He screamed it. He also <laughs> coincidentally had a shaved head. Uh, he, oh. I'm turning into a trope. A stereotype. It's time to resign. So, uh, got the glasses and everything. I can't believe I fell for this. So, I said this would never happen to me. Now, uh, uh, I said that about a lot of things, though, and here I am. As Keaton would say, there you are. So, um, that's what happens. She gets mad already, and she wakes up, and I'm still there, and she's like, well, there you are. Thought you might be gone overnight. So, um, Bobby said, you deserve hell. And I remember asking him afterwards. You know, I was that quiet kid that wouldn't talk to the youth pastor. Um, and I in, in junior high, and I said, "Why? Why do we deserve hell?" And he said, "Because owed is gives you the context that you have worked for something and you are owed something. God doesn't owe you grace. If He owes you grace, it's not grace. If He owes you mercy, it's not mercy. But He can owe you judgment because you work for that." He can give you exactly what you spent your whole life working for, which is hell. And I remember being shook, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old kid. I remember being shook when he said that. And I thought on it. I thought on it, I thought on it, I thought on it. And I am 
didn't like it. But he's right. What God owes you is judgment. What he gives you is grace. What he gives you is forgiveness in the gospel. Amen? That's good news, ladies and gentlemen. So please, cut off all this nonsense about God owes me certain things. And God's better give me what I'm owed. Now, he can give you what Christ is owed. And he's owed everything because of his atoning work on the cross. He can give you, and he does, thank God. He gives you what Christ is owed in Christ as a Christian. But apart from him, on your own, just remember that's what you're owed. So if you go, you're not being fair to me, God. You know, there may be people. That I know and love. There may be people right now that may be thinking that in my family. I hope not. But there may be people. And that's a that's a human response. Job, I haven't earned this. This is not what I work for. I have followed you my whole life. I've obeyed you. I did everything you said. Why in the world are you giving me all these boils and you destroyed my house and you killed my kids and all? You did all these things. Not to mention you didn't kill the one person I want to die, which is my wife. She keeps nagging me to death. Why don't you just curse God and die, Job? And Job's like, no, I, I have some things to talk to him about for sure, but I wish he would curse you and you die. But no, I've got boils from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And we, yeah, we got some things to hash out. But Lord have mercy. I have done what you said. I'm owed better than this. If you ever find yourself, and I hope you hear, listen. I know we think this is a game sometimes, but there's going to come a day where you're not any longer going to be in this youth group. And there's going to come a day where I'm not sitting back here. Please hear me when I say this. When you start to feel like your life is out of control, number one, it's not. It's always been out of your control, but it's never outside of his. And number two, when you start to think that you're not getting what you're owed, remember what Bobby said, what you're actually owed is hell. What you get above that, which is everything, because you're never going to hell in Christ, is gravy. Number three is this. When I start to feel like I've, I'm owed something better, and that I've worked for something better, just remember that in God's economy, I don't work for his favor. Andrea doesn't do five Hail Marys and crawl on her knees on broken glass to, you know, retrieve the mail and come back and then, you know, pray for ten minutes and God pats her on the head and says, here's a lollipop, Andrea. Right? <clears throat> she gets the lollipop, so to say, but that's because of what Christ has done. Thank God. This is good news. One day, one day I hope you jump for joy. And I won't be here to see it when people recite the good news to you. I won't be here. That's okay. I hope, I hope that some kid you sit down someday and you explain to them what I have spent two years trying to explain to you. Just once. It's the best news in the world. And it's true. It just so happens to be the greatest fairy tale ever told is 100% true. Anxiety is, anxiety is revealed by the fact that we trust God as long as things are going well. Which piggybacks on the other one. As long as things are going well. But here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. Friday, my grandpa was doing a lot better. He was starting to make improvements. By Saturday morning, he was gone. Friday, you ever notice that when things go well, you... You pray a lot less. You ever notice, you ever ask yourself why? I can tell you. The reason you pray a lot less when things go well is because when things go well, you very quickly get the notion in your head that you, for some stupid reason, are actually in control. And then when something bottoms out in your life, like Saturday morning, you fall on your face like I did. And you cry out to the person that you know is actually in charge. And while, you know, like Dad, he, Dad, my dad said that to me the other day. He said, you know, I read somewhere, Taylor, that 
true anguish and pain emotionally only lasts for about 12 seconds. And then we start doing everything in the human mind and body to try to block that out, cope with it, reroute it, direct it in a different way. 12 seconds. You do understand it's, it's possible to die of a broken heart. It's possible to be so sad. Well, it's possible to be so sad and burdened that you sweat drops of blood. Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus. Sweat drops of literal blood because of what was about to happen to him the next morning on the cross. My point, ladies and gentlemen, is this. We're really good, really good at convincing ourselves in the light of all of the evidence to the contrary that we are in control. But I've never heard someone run up to a horrific car accident, and I've seen plenty of those, run up to a horrific car accident and then bow down and go, Taylor, I just ask that you take control in this moment. I know that you're sovereign. I know that you love us. I know you're here. I know you haven't abandoned me and you and us because we're all the same. I know you haven't abandoned me. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's how you end your prayer. It's preposterous. It's ridiculous. And if you're not laughing, you should be. Nobody bows down and, and prays to the neighbor's cat. Nobody bows down and prays to themselves. Nobody bows down to the deist God who's so limp-wristed he can't even be bothered to give a crap about any of us. Nobody prays in those moments to Allah. That doesn't happen. In those moments, on the side of the road when people are bleeding to death or when people walking with gunshot wounds spraying blood 20 feet across the room onto a wall that I have watched with my own two eyes, a giant gaping hole in their chest they're not crying out, Krishna, save me. They're crying out, Jesus, have mercy on me. We all know inherently and implicitly who is in control. We just spend our whole life trying to lie to ourselves that we're actually in control. But when the rubber meets the road, the last moment of your life, if you get a last moment, the last moment of your life, the cognizant moment, you are going to be chiefly aware of exactly who's in charge. And then the next moment, the one that begins your forever moment, that will never have been clearer in your life. Never will that have been clearer. Every single human being from Adam to the last human being on this planet will stand before the one who's got nails, scars in his hands and his feet because he is in charge. Not only is he in charge, he's a judge. And he's going to judge. We always love that. John 5. I talked through that. I think we might have even been at the literacy council at that point. John 5. He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to raise the dead. And we all go, yay, hoorah. What's he raising them to, though? Judgment. Everyone is going to stand before him. Everyone. Why? Because he's a judge. If he's got the right to bring you out from the grave, both spiritually and physically, he's dang sure got the right to ask some questions of you. See, the sooner that you break this notion that you actually do control your circumstances and that you actually do have control over the things in your life, in that moment you will then turn to the one, by the way, I don't know about you, but I've lived long enough to realize that what I thought I was in control of, I've almost always messed it up. Luther had a great quote. In fact, Martin Luther, you don't know that is. Martin Luther had a great quote. He said, Everything I've ever held in my hands tightly, I have lost. But the things that I, now hear me, students, the things that I have placed in his hands, those things I still possess. That's a heck of a quote. Things that I've held tightly, like trying to hold a fistful of water. Doesn't work. But the things that I gave to him, those I still possess. 
You don't actually love things unless you give them to him by the way. I just want to point that out. If you're hoarding them for you, you're not loving that thing and you're not loving God the way you ought to. But that's bonus content. So, verse 22. Notice Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. Jesus said these verses in the context of people being afraid of what it is that happens with them in their lives, with specifically the context of being afraid about the future. And money, of course. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? Money. But also, future. How many of you guys worry about the future? Let's be honest. And you, you people who are right on the edge of, of college don't even try pretending that you don't worry about college. And I get it. I get it, by the way. You know what? Um, <laughs> Ryan, Max, maybe a few of you guys in here. If you guys go to college, I know some of you guys are. If you go to college, we'll be in college together. Right? I'll just be 14 years ahead of you. And still in college. So, hashtag respect Jenny Walker. So, now, I say that to say this, ladies and gentlemen. There are some moments in our life that are really fearful. I mean, I ain't gonna lie. I see it here and I say whatever I want. I was nervous the day I got married. I was fearful. I had anxiety, palpitations, and it ain't just because she was pretty. She is. Notice I didn't say she was. So, love you, baby. Um, but, but also, I was nervous because I knew this is the beginning of the rest of my life with this person. And also, it's the beginning of the end. It's also the beginning and the end of my freedom. <laughs> right? Shouts. Now, that's great. I love the slavery I'm in. So, <laughs> now, here's the thing that I want to make clear, right? Here's a ball and chain. Here's the thing that I want to make clear. You know what? Here's y'all like, you're going to be in the doghouse. You haven't been to my house, most likely. We have the house, that's where Hamill and Keaton live, and then we have a really large doghouse. It says Taylor and that's where I live. So, I don't go out there from time to time, that's where I'm going to go home to tonight. So, now, here's the thing that I want to make sure we hear. The future can be really scary, right? We have all these corny phrases here at home, Caleb, God help us. Lord, have mercy. So, you hear it on Caleb, you hear it on Go Fish or whatever that 105.1 or 4.1 or whatever it is. What's the name of that other channel? Not Kicker 102.5, but the the other Christian channel. I don't listen to radio. Huh? Yeah, Air One. Yeah, I thought it was Go Fish. Okay, so, so Air One. I mean, I thought like Jesus Fish, right? So, um, anyway... Caleb, which they do half their time singing and the other half is begging for money. It, it is. Every time I turn it on, they're like, all right, we just need five more partners in the next 30 minutes. The partner went $100. And I'm like, click. So let me turn over here to Kenneth. No, I'm just kidding. So here's my point. Here's my point. So I'm, I'm being wild. Here's my point. When we talk about the future, it's true that we don't know the future. And if you do, talk to me afterwards. I've got some questions for you. But if you, if you don't know the future, like all of us don't, you have to trust either that the future is going to have positive outcomes. I, I hate when Christians, can I just say this? I and mean, I'm on a tangent anyway. I, I hate when Christians say, well, Christians. They start attributing things to fate or they start attributing good things or even bad things in their life to fate or here's the one that we love in the 21st century, the universe. Good vibes only. Positive vibes only. We wear t-shirts. Proud of it. You even know what a vibe is? No, I, I'm not talking about sociologically what a vibe is. Just like you don't flip and know you're wearing yoga pants on your yoga mats. You don't know what that is either. Yoga is a spiritual practice. If you're engaging in that, stop. My name's Taylor. I'll be here all week. 
until I'm not and they get rid of me. But here's the thing that I want to make sure you guys hear. If I don't know the future, I have to at least trust the person who holds the future, right? I have to at least be able to say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust him. Right? And so, um, correctly translated, this means do not be anxious. Anxiety's definition, and I don't know if I said this earlier, anxiety's definition is... Are y'all okay? Let me ask you this because it is seven, almost 35. Are y'all okay for for us to make this a two-part next week, or should I just move to another subject? Raise your hand if you want to if you want to go to a new subject. I understand, and I know some of you guys, you know, unfortunately won't be here. I understand that, but but for your benefit. Are you getting something out of this? Should we extend it into next week? or well, How many of you guys want to extend it to next week? Okay. Um, my official marker. So, anxiety, listen, here, here's a definition so some of you guys can go home and it can help you. Anxiety is defined, and I looked this up in the, I believe, Webster's Dictionary. Experiencing worry, shh, unease, or nervousness, typically about an imminent event. Or something with an uncertain outcome. Now, by the way, I just want to point out, that's everything. Everything is an imminent event. And everything's an uncertain outcome. I mean, really deep, honestly. There's very little that you can actually guarantee will turn out the way you think it will, for sure. I mean, seriously, right? I mean, can we be honest? Very little in your life do you actually control. I mean, I've already, I've already talked about that. But like everything's uncertain. Do you do you know what's going to happen five seconds from now? No. No, you don't know what's going to happen five seconds from now. Do you know what's going to happen in this room five seconds from now? Do you know? You know you you don't know any variable really, and even the ones that you control because you do them. We don't have great self control. Believe me, I know. I'm with you guys all day, every day. We don't have great self-control. Heck, most adults don't have great self-control. I see it all the time in here in the cafe when I shake people's hands and, you know, ask them how they're doing. They can say, oh, I'm their lips. Say one thing, right? But their face is like saying a whole different thing and they can't control it. Right? Because we all, we all, everyone thinks they have a poker face. Most of us don't. And it's probably a good thing. Because we lie so much to each other that someone needs to stitch and it just may as well be the thing on the front of your head. Right? So, by the way, I, and we can cut it We can cut it off here. Um, I don't know what page because like an idiot. I didn't number them. Oh, yeah, we're on page 7 out of 25. Okay, so here, look. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to own it. I'm not ashamed. I'm beautiful. And I'm fat and I'm proud and I'm not ashamed. Okay? So, hear me though, before you tune out and you start gossiping about how I'll be something. Please stay with me. Who's the money? Lord? Yes, is that you? Okay, so. But I, it did throw me off because I was like, how's that thing going for this? The shaft? <laughs> uh, anyways, I'm glad y'all got that third level joke. Okay, so. So. By the way, don't read that book. Don't watch that. Don't, if you haven't. <laughs> Effective immediately. <laughs> so, so look, look, listen, 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 listen. Okay, I know, I know, I know Sarah Young has entered the chat, but please hear me. Okay, here's... <laughs> so, here's the last thing I want to say, okay? And, and this is serious, so let's change emotional gears real quick. When Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. This is an imperative in the Greek. It's not a suggestion. It's not an open-ended clause. He is commanding you. You. Yes, you tonight. He is commanding you that when you walk out of these doors, no matter how encouraging or how useful this has been to you tonight, or maybe how not useful it's been to you tonight, because I'm stupid. Maybe there's that. 
He's, regardless of what I said tonight, these words are still forever written in red letters. And Jesus said, not one jot or tittle, not one crossing of the T or dotting of the I will pass away until all of these things have been fulfilled. So when Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, it's just as important now as it was then. And please hear me, guys. I really want to emphasize this. Jesus is commanding you not to worry. He's not saying do your best. He's telling you stop. Cease and desist right now. Stop it. That, that In fact, in the Greek, that's the, the emphasis. Stop. Abruptly, finally, harshly. Now. Don't do it again. How many of you guys ever done something like that and your, your parents, maybe your little, maybe it's now. Hey, my dad still does that to me. I'll be doing something stupid and he's like, stop it right now. Especially when I was younger. Grab me by the hand. Stop. Don't do it again. You do it again, there's going to be consequences. All right? Spank, whatever it may be. May throw them through the window. Whatever is, whatever, whatever you choose. Okay? Get taken to Chick Fil A for some ice cream. Whatever the consequence is. Okay? That's more like them now. But here's the thing that I, or like Interstellar for you guys who watch that movie. I'll, I'll take her. I'll just, I'll just take her to the baseball park. And get some popcorn and coke, right? So here's my point. It's not optional. It's not something that will be taken into consideration by his disciples at this moment. But the command, nonetheless, the command is meant to be followed just as much as love your neighbor as yourself. This is absolutely an imperative command. And it has to be followed. Your inability or your lack of desire to stop worrying is a crisis and an issue of faith. And I want to say that. He's not, Jesus didn't say, do the best you could and then sit and wring your hands about it. Fret as much as possible. He said, do not worry. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Trust Him. Don't make excuses. Crucify your anxiety. I am not a mental health professional. I do not claim to be. There is one that comes to this meeting occasionally, but I am not her. Okay? But what I know is the Greek, and what I know is what Jesus meant by what he said, and that is without question. Stop it right now. Don't do it again. Stop. This moment. Okay? So, cut it off here. And I know...